Although it's, I've got to say, it's got to be funny for you. And I said this to, to Tucker, to Jericho a few weeks ago, too. Must have been funny for you at the start of the pandemic to all of a sudden watch every single DJ start to rush to Twitch. <laughs> yeah, dude, I have so I had so many DMs, so many DMs. And my answer was the same. You know, if you have the time and the will and the, you know, passion for uh, live streaming and gaming in particular, run it, you know, but it's not something that can be done overnight. It's not something that can be as simple as just pop on the computer and get on there. It's like, it's like doing an entirely new hobby, an entirely new space that you're kind of going into and just to go into it with, you know, love and passion and not expect like this crazy turnout. Like people are like, well, what? I have not had that lot, lot of viewers, but I have great socials. I was like, it doesn't really matter. You know, you're starting a whole new genre with people who don't know that you're doing this. It's just something that you are should be allowed to do, but it's definitely not a moneymaker, which people are, were not expecting. Yeah. People are expecting it to be like a replacement for touring, which it's completely never going to be. Yeah. So it was just, it was funny to see like the people who stuck with it and like actually love it. Cause there's a few people who actually love it. You know, like eliminate or certain artists who like kill it yeah, and love great. it. And yeah, they're loving the space, which is so cool to watch, but the majority kind of went like, and they're like, no, yeah, it was you know, such it's too a, much work. It was such a temporary relationship too. Like the second shows came back, people were just like, Nope. <laughs> Dude, I remember webcams were sold out on Amazon. And I remember John calling me and be like, yo, Wax needs a, a, a freaking webcam. Do you have any? I'm like, I like searched through like, like old stuff. I was like, I had this old like 1945 like Razer webcam. And I gave it to him. He's like, you saved my life. Yeah. I was like, a crank got operated webcam. Yeah, yeah. literally. Because everything was sold out because everyone was like, we got a live stream. Oh, I mean, like, I, got, I had to pay a... Cra- I'm like embarrassed to say how much I paid to get one because it was the only option. Like people were people were price gouging. Oh yeah, supply was short. And I felt really. I felt it was like one thing of like validation that made me feel really good. That I was like, I already have all my shit. Like, yeah. I'm already set up. Like <laughs> I already have my stream. My fan, my fans know that I'm a cup. I'm gonna be here. So it was really nice to have that security. I feel like just with touring being, you know, the ninety percent of my money income to that going away and me going, you know, I'm so thankful that I had stream to fall back on because like I always have stream. So like having that full time was like a really big blessing. I feel like just for like my mental health wise too. Like if I had nothing to do every day, like I could, I could only write so much music, Right. you know, I was like, I need something else. So extreme really came in, um, which it always does. I love doing it anyways, but it came in really, you know, important for me to be able to do that and work the same amount just in a different way. Yeah, and it was, yeah. also, it was cool to share with people, with uh, other DJs that I was cool to show them the space, you know, some people really enjoyed it and it's cool to watch some people grow. And like, if you only did it for a month, whatever, it's, it's just, it's cool to see like, people come into a space that's new and are forced to like, kind of like see it in the space. And oh yeah. Out. I mean, it, it's humbling. I, it was absolutely yeah. humbling for me. And I, I know for a lot of other people, like uh, I, I think DJs, especially you tend to look at other creative things as being like, Oh yeah, I could do that. Whatever. You know, mm-hmm. it's easy. I, like you said, I've already got a following, so I'll just, easy. you know, I'll just hop over. It'll be simple, but you get yeah. to something like Twitch, which is just a whole different environment. And yeah. you got to build from the ground up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Twitch is Twitch is majority a gaming platform still, which people don't realize. Like, you know, it's awesome that they're branching out with all this new music channels and the hot tub channel. What there's so many new yeah, right. ventures on Twitch, but the majority of Twitch is gaming. And that's where the majority of the viewership is. So, like, I was telling people, they're like, I get no views when I do music streams, but I get views when I game. I'm like, well, then game. Right. Why not? <laughs> and I'm like, just do whatever you need to do to have a good time right now in this quarantine and to take this time off from touring. Whatever it is, just this is a really cool space to authentically connect with your viewers in a whole new way and your fans in a whole new way. And to, that for them to really see another side of DJ, because you know, a lot of DJs have these personas online and aren't very personable and aren't very relatable. And so having this moment for you to actually live stream to these fans is a real, I think a beautiful thing. That's why I told everyone like, for, fuck the money, you're not yeah. going to make money, right? You're not, you're just not, unless you put so much time into it, which is fine. But you're, once touring comes back, you're, I know you're going to go back to touring. So at the end of the day, it's not a money maker, but this is a really cool bonding experience to grow that fan base to make them even more in love with you and make them even more supportive of your shit by showing them a new side of you, which I think is really important. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, I think you've been you've been on that for so long just by virtue of kind of the way you came into the game and, and right. all of that. I, I think that kind of expertise, I'm sure it's served you really well. And I think, yeah, for other DJs, it's it's almost an ego thing, right? Where I think a lot of DJs don't want to just be like, 
oh, no, I'm just like a, a guy in front of a webcam when you're not seeing me on stage, right? It's like, hard to like go from like headlining a show and being like a top dog right. to then going on live stream and not connecting. Um, and then kind of like starting from square one, which I think is a beautiful thing, right? Like I and the spots where it's like even having three viewers on a stream is big bigger than most people who stream right. right there's millions of people who stream to zero people yeah so i'm like even having 10 people is a really awesome accomplishment and having those people connect with you is really cool i know it sucks ego wise like oh, the numbers the numbers numbers but i think in twitch like these numbers are not that important here right i think it's really cool just to connect with your fans during a crazy time of covid where you can't tour like why not connect that way and just start from square one be humble about that i think that's a really cool thing and i hope that some artists maybe found that and maybe found that space and cherished it compared to like oh fuck it i'm not doing it if i'm not huge yeah i completely you know? completely agree and i i think what you're saying like the absolutely the numbers I, i've become less concerned about that because with anything you know i no one was a big dj when they started any of that but i i guess for me it made me admire the way you've built your career and and the way you've done it more because like you said, it sort of doesn't matter what platform you're operating on when you have a direct connection to the people who like what you do, right? Yeah. And I think and that's like, something you've built really strongly. I don't know if that was like the intention early on or or if it's just how it worked out. But I, to me, it gave me a much bigger appreciation for what you and people like you and people on Twitch and all that do because... You know, for DJs for so long, it was kind of like, well, there's one path. You do it this way and that's it, right? And you yeah. just climb the ladder more or less. Yeah. And there's only one ladder. Yeah, there's only one ladder in the same lineups and this is how it's going to be. And I don't know, I think like even during COVID, it was a kind of a, just a mind check for me as well, just to, you know, appreciate that like some people, everyone's trying to do this, right? This the entertainment is the, the dream job and for a lot of people. Right. And to even have one play on Spotify, to even have six viewers in chat, to even have people buy my merch, four people buy my merch. I, I had to sit and really think and be like, that's the gift, right? Because like, if I can pay rent with, with my art, yeah. then I think I've won, yep. right? Like, and I, I was sick of like trying to compete and trying to get to this place where like, I never felt like I fit in on that traditional ladder, right? I kind of got into this on EDM, but then I kind of wanted to do live, but I still do Twitch. And I, I never wanted to stay on that typical ladder. And sometimes it hurts. I'm like, if I did stick on that ladder, would I be... Would I be really high up on that ladder if I stuck through it? Who knows? But this is the way that it works authentically for me. And right. like changing even one person's life or letting one person listen to my song, even that alone is an accomplishment. I can pay my rent. I'm happy to be here. And it's something that it's, I think a lot of artists feel is pressure that we're not big enough. We're competing. We're competing. But like even just being in this space, being on one lineup is what every so many millions of people dream of. Of course. So like we, should be, we have to be thankful for that moment. I think COVID gave me that the opportunity to sit and really be, be blessed and think about how much that, you know, life is precious. And like, like the way I was going was so my, my, my eyes were closed and mm. I was just doing what I've done for years. And I was just touring and doing and doing and doing and spending and doing this stuff. And I think COVID really forced me to sit with myself and figure out what truly makes me happy. And right. now after this, my life's changed, right? Like my priorities have changed. My goals have changed because it made me force myself to sit down and see what's going on well, and right. see what I want to do. Well, yeah, yeah, of course. And I, I think a lot of people had those moments. And to just take it back to what you said a second ago, you know, you were like, oh, if I just stayed on the ladder, like, could I have been bigger? Could there have been more stuff, whatever? And to me, it's always, always the question is like, well, would you have been happy? Sure, you, maybe you could have been, you know, some crazy DJ megastar, but it's like, would you be happy doing that? Would you be, you know, fulfilled, all of that? And then it makes me wonder, you know, you mentioned like this time you were able to reevaluate. I was doing the same thing over here as far as, you know, what do I actually like to do? What do I what is valuable to me in this experience? What did you find out? What what have you changed? How did your priorities shift? I mean, I feel like I mean, especially for me and Hayden, like when we we were forced to like live in a 500 square foot apartment with two cats. And I feel like it gave us perspective on our relationship as a person, as a whole, but also our priorities as we love our, we got beef. Our right. dog has changed our life. Like it's literally our child. He so said the things, same thing to me. Yeah. Right. It's just like, 
those priorities were not even in our space. Like we were so used to, he was gone 24 seven on the road, no questions asked, missing my birthdays, missing important days, not home for Christmas. I was doing the same. I was like, I'm too busy for this. I'm too busy for that. My friendships were not important. My family wasn't important. I was just like, so on this train of like, I'm a DJ. I got to work. I'm, I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. And because everything was competing, everything was, you know how crazy it was. There's lineups every day. There was festivals every day. There were shows every two days. It's like, it got to the point where I think we are, we are, our eyes were closed and we were just going on the train. Right? right. I think COVID really forced us to break. Like he didn't force him to break. Like he was touring more than I've ever seen anyone tour. Right. And I was touring half as much, but still for me, that was so much. And for us to like really sit, and be like, you can't go out. A, fix your relationship. B, fix what you need. Fix what you're going through. Fix a little. It like really forced us to figure out what's what's important. And now, like now, it's easy, way easier for me to say no to a show. Mm. The pressure's off. The pressure's yeah. off. Like I used to feel like I, it's an opportunity. I can't say no. I can't say no. I, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. And now I'm like, you know what? Actually, I really want to do this with my family. I have that stay booked off. I'm going to say no to that. Or you know what? That show doesn't seem worth it or safe. I'm just going to skip on on that. I feel like that confidence and that like being able to say no, I feel like I've, I have that gift now when before I felt so much pressure to never say no. That's huge. That's huge. Huge. I mean, I'm the same way. I always want to say yes to things. I always, A, I want to make people happy, but also, you know, there's that fear of like, well, if I don't take every opportunity, what if it's gone? What if it never comes back? Who else is going to take that spot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but the funny part is, right, once you start saying no, that's the best position to be in. It's there's, you know, that power of no, whatever. It's absolutely true. That yeah. once you, you know, because at the end of the day, like you said, it's a self-worth thing. It's a confidence thing. And I think that, I don't know, I, I was about to say that attracts similar energy, but I don't even know if I believe if I <laughs> believe in that. But I think it, it really does just anytime you say no to something, it does always manage to come back around in yeah. a better form. You know, I agree. I agree. I agree. Trusting your gut's really important. And I feel like like me and Hayden, like, I don't know what we did pre COVID, but like now during our weekdays, we smoke weed, watch movies, do puzzles. Like we do this shit that we've never done. Like before it was going out in the scene, what we're we doing, where we're we going, where drinks, poop party, whatever the right. fuck it is. Right now we're just really selective. And now we're like, kind of like, we love going out with our friends, but we also love just sitting at home and cooking and paying out with beef and do it. Like those things never existed before. Yeah. Like, I really was like, wow, I think that my life is so much more fulfilling right now because I'm choosing what makes me happy. And I was forced to kind of reevaluate what yeah. was important to me and yeah. what was important to Hayden. Well, cause it, we spend so much time in, in this career chasing something that is eventually going to yes. supposedly yes. make us happy. Right. Right. And right. then, and then it's like every once in a while you realize like, Oh, well, if I made the decision to be happy right now, I could just do that and, and not have to chase it. Right. If I just did something else and it's such a, I don't know. There's people who probably figured this out a long time ago that, you know, I just sound like an idiot at this point, but oh. it, it's so true. It, it's so, it's such a wild realization to be like, yeah, let's, we're all ambitious. We're all motivated. We'll, we have goals. You can chase them, but you can also just, ever, you know, be in the moment sometimes. Like, yeah. And like focus on other shit and have other passions and other loves that you want to focus on. And like, I don't know, it really made me, it made me specifically just have so much more perspective on things that are important to me. And you know, that like touring is just not my number one. Like I just don't love touring. You know, it's yeah. ne- it's been really hard for me. It's been a struggle for me always. But I feel like before COVID, it was easy because I was on the train. I was just going and going and going. And now I really have to reevaluate what's important to me. And I feel like touring is something that I love to do, but in moderation for my for me and my mental health and my life. And like music is more important to me than touring and then the DJ culture. It's tour, 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 tour. Yeah. So for me to kind of like switch my perspective and be like, I want to focus more on my live music and my music because that's what I was doing before COVID. And it kind of gave me that that love and that cherish again. Like, you know, I made the right choice. Cause like I just did this little mini run like last week. I like ended it like literally on Sunday ended. And I literally came home and I was like, that felt so weird. <laughs> it felt so weird. Like I know that COVID has, you know, got the vaccine and things are 
looking up, not really. Yeah, but not like really. going on the road really gave me like a perspective of like, I don't want to be doing this right now. It doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem safe. It seems the crowd is inter- like people are scared. I can feel it in the crowd. Yeah, I was you know? going to ask you how the, how it actually felt in front of people. I, I told everyone this. It's every day is a different day, right? I had an amazing show in Albuquerque, right? Slammed 2,000 people, door on the line. Everyone was wearing masks. Everyone was respectful of me. It was a beautiful moment. I was yeah. like, wow. My first show back I was like, this is it. I missed this so much. And then the next couple of shows, I had some really empty shows, you know, or people were just really scared or the, the vaccine check at the door. They didn't have, they didn't have it. Right. So they couldn't come in. So half the fans are pissed at me thinking that I am some pro vaccine. They are, they're pissed at me that, that, that they thinking that I chose that, right. you know, or people in the crowd were really scared to be in the crowd. So they're trying to go away. And then it's just like, there's like some weird energies, of course, some amazing shows like that, like really fulfilled my, my soul of music. I was like, this is what I love to do. But 50% of them were really like da- heart, disheartened. Mm. You know, it's like with COVID still happening, people are still scared, fans are still upset. I'm still upset. Like I, I, I was begging for some promoters to give a shit. Right. I literally would say, "Hey, what are your resources for testing?" I've been in six different states in eight days. I'm feeling a little run down. I want to make sure that I'm safe tonight. And they go, "We don't really do that." And I was like, "Okay." Show up to the show, no masks, slammed backstage. Everyone touching me, grabbing me, yeah. no, like taking my bottle, drinking it, drinking this. I literally looked at my tour manager and she's going, I don't even, know. she's like, I'm so uncomfortable. And they made us sign a waiver saying, if we get COVID, we can't sue. Oh and I'm sitting God. here, I'm just sitting here, like, I have tried so hard to be safe. I'm going above and beyond. I'm getting tested every two days. Like, I have the vaccine. I'm not doing meet and greets without my mask. I'm, I'm doing so many things right now. I have Lysol wipes. I'm doing all this shit, right? And right. no one else is giving a fuck. And it's really hard for me to feel more confident going on the road when no one else gives a shit. Yeah, especially if going on the road in the first place is like already a risk. A, a risk. And and even pre-COVID, it's, you know, a stressful thing, right? Like you were talking about how the, there's different priorities. You want to be at home. You want to be working on music, all of that, which is hard to do if you're you're going all the time, let alone if you're worried about COVID, let alone worried about people Absolutely. touching you, all that kind of stuff. It's, how is how is writing music been for you in this time? Have you been able to? Because I know yeah. I know a lot of our friends kind of felt like creatively a little stunted because like the whole machine stopped. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I, for a point there, like I feel like maybe like pre, like real COVID when we were really locked down, it got to a point where like it was just a little recycled. I, I couldn't, I didn't have the inspiration to write about anything other than sad, depressed, locked down. That time, I, I kind of got in this thing. You know, I write a lot about my experiences, about what I'm going through. So like for like eight months there, it was the same every day. That was kind of getting hard for me to like, I was pulling from past experiences to write about. You know, sure. I was trying to write about like past traumas or past ex- relationships. I was trying to do that. But it got to a point where I was like, I need some fresh, I need some freshness. I need to be doing something in my life to be able to spark this inspiration again, you know? And then, you know, lockdown went out. I went to Thailand and did that. So that gave me some more inspiration. So I got past it. But for, I guess, good six months there, I was like, I don't even want to write. Mm. I was like, I've already written this quarantine song. I've already written six songs about being sad inside. <laughs> I've already written songs about how much I hate Trump. I've already written all those. Right. So I was like, I was like, what else? I need something, whatever. Even if I just go to the movie theater, like that will give me inspiration uh, compared to just sitting inside. Every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. When you've got nothing, yeah. you'll take, you'll take whatever. Yeah, I was like anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, the last time you were on the show, you know, we were talking about how you were kind of always a writer in some form or another whether it was, you know, journaling, whether it was writing songs, whether, you know, a bunch of different things. What What is your relationship to writing these days? Like, is do you write something every day, even if it's just for you? Yeah, always. I'm always writing. I'm always writing. And, you know, there's a point where I was kind of thinking, like, can I start writing for other people? And then I got to the point where I just don't want to give my sauce away yet. You know, I love assisting and I'm down to do that or down to maybe pitch my songs that don't work for me. But it's hard for me when I'm still on this stage of going up this mountain. Right. It's hard for me to give my time to another artist when I'm still trying to do that shit for me. Yeah. You know, I think we'll get to a point where my career, I'll be like, hey, you know what? We're going steady now. I can start writing for the people. And I think that that day will come. But I think right now, it's just like, it's just too busy for me to be doing all this and then also writing for other people. It's a little bit of a struggle. And I think it takes away the bit of the magic for me. Yeah. But I do love pitching my songs out. Some songs just don't work for my shit. And I always push those out. But, you know, I've been writing every single day. I always write every single day. I have so much writing. I have so much music coming out and so much music planned and so much music in the works. 
Um, I feel like all my songs had to get a pause. I didn't really, I released two songs during the past two years. Cause I feel like it's just people, I don't know. It just didn't feel right to put out my best work when everyone was in a state of, you know, going through their own shit. Like people were freaking dying. It didn't yeah. feel right for me to be like, ah, you know, it just didn't <laughs> feel, it just felt like it needed a pause on it, you know? Yep. So now I think we're amping amp- 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 back up and I'm relooking at all the music. I'm kind of retouching it all now because I feel like it's been old. So I'm like, let's just revamp it up and put it out there. And I'm excited for that. Like music is my, you know, what I want to do regardless. If I make money or not, I always want to put music out. Yeah, I'm just of back course. on that train now. Well, that's great. I mean, yeah, what is it what does the train look like at this point? Because I, I know you had right before lockdown started, you were about to do a live band tour. And yes. And you had done I mean, you had done at least a few live shows before that, right? Yeah, I feel like 2019 really put me on the map for my live stuff and I was transitioned over completely and I was being, I was seen as an artist, you know, as a singer, as a songwriter. Um, and then COVID hit, obviously, and I had to cancel my all my live tours, all my live show festivals got canceled. Everything got pushed back. All my music got pushed back. And I feel like it really stagnated my career. Mm. But for better or for worse, right, it happens. And so this time around now, we're just doing the exact same thing. So all my music is alternative uh, leaning and pop punkish leaning is just coming from my heart. You guys know that I always put out what I want to put out. I'm never going to stick to a genre, even though it's successful. I'm not going to do, I'm always going to do what authentically feels right for me, regardless um, of what's going on. And I'm excited just to get it out. And I feel like it's been, I feel like it's so old now, like this music, cause it's been a lot of, it's been, you know, some of it's been written during quarantine and we're killing it. But some of the songs are like two years old because we couldn't put it out because right. of COVID, right? So it's like just getting the, I just want to get that into the ether. I'm just like ready for it to like hit the earth yeah. and just get away from my space so I can move on from, for something else. Right, exactly. I mean, that's part of it, right? It's like, I think we all want to move on, whether it's moving on creatively, whether it's mm-hmm. just trying to, you know, forget about the last year, whatever it is. I, I think exactly. everybody has that energy. I, yeah. I completely relate to yeah. that. I mean, at this point, like, do you see yourself as fitting into a particular scene or or group or posse or any of that? Like for the live band shows, for what you're working on now, what kind of environment do you see them being presented in? You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, like I've always felt this struggle, even since I was a kid. I've always do I always do a few things. Right. Instead of doing one thing really great, I do a few things. And that's how I've always been. My mom's always told me that I've never been able to stick to one thing. I always just follow what's going on. So it's been hard for me to find like where I'd fit because I don't think I do fit anywhere because I do. I love DJing. I will always DJ. But will I make EDM music? No. I want to be in a band and I want to sing and I want to be able to be like Bring Me the Horizon, bring, be like MGK. I want to be able to be like Atlanta more set back in the day, Jan- Joan Jett back in the day, no doubt. Like that's my dream for music. Yeah. I want to be able to perform and put music out that I love. That's it, period. I don't care where, who, when, how. I just want to be able to do that. Well, also I love streaming. I love gaming. I love video games. I will always do that too. So like, I think I'm just going to be Cray. It's just going to be me. And I feel like now if you follow me now and you follow me for this long, you kind of just know that I'm just going to do whatever the fuck feels right to me. Right. And if you fuck with it, let's go. And if you don't, that's so cool because the next thing you might. Yeah, which which I love. And I think, you know, for anybody watching this now or listening back later, I mean, it, there's there's a lot of inspiration in what you're talking about because I think the reason you're able to operate that way is because you really built your whole thing. You built the people, the the core of the people who like what you do kind of outside of the traditional industry route, right? And yeah. that's, it's a longer path. I think it's maybe sometimes a more frustrating path, especially at the start. But if you do it that way, that is the one way to ensure that you can do whatever you want, right? Just ha- happiness, honestly. It's like, I've been told millions of times that the road I'm taking is not the quickest road to fame and money, right? I've been told millions of times and it doesn't, I've realized it doesn't really matter to me. Like, it just really doesn't. Like, I really... It's really hard for me to fake anything. It's very obvious if I'm doing something I don't want to do. Um, and I don't want to do that. I really want to be... I want to t- tell everyone to just be your authentic self because it will work out more than you faking it and following. I was just unhappy on this DJ train that I was on a couple of years ago. I felt very unfulfilled. Um, not that DJing is that for anybody, but for me and my soul, it just felt didn't feel right. I didn't love it. I didn't... Right. I was like, when Hayden goes on the road, he is gleaming. His face and eyes are shining. He is literally... 
thriving. Like Perfect I've never seen him. Skin, a, yeah. <laughs> yes. Like he's just like the happiest man, right? And like commanding the crowd. And you can see the love between the fans and him. It's a gorgeous thing. When I'm on the road, I'm like in my bed, like curled up, like crying. You know, like I'm like <laughs> yeah. COVID scared. I'm like, oh my God. Like it doesn't, it's just a different feeling for me. And I was like, I'm not feeling what he's feeling on the road. Like I want to be able to feel that passionate. And that's when I started singing and writing and doing what I wanted to do. And I felt, you know what? This feels so much better when I sleep at night than me following this train that I just didn't really belong in. Right. I felt like I was trying to be this EDM, you know, DJ. And I love DJing because I love DJing. Because I think DJing is super fun. I love playing the rooms. I don't love being an EDM act. Right. And that just wasn't, it wasn't connecting with me. Um, not that I don't, I love, I love going to festivals now. I love watching hate. I love watching my friends. I think it's amazing. I, will, I love being a fan. But for me, just EDM, like my music I was making wasn't fulfilling me. And I, I, can, I think you could see that when I was on the sure. road. And so now it's different because now I can play my music. Even during my DJ sets, I play, I make edits and I play all my songs and I sing and I do all that stuff. And that's what gives me joy. And meeting people in the audience is really what made this past tour worth it for me because there was I met some incredible people that came out and they were vaccinated and that gave a shit and that said thank you. Like That was a really special moment for me. But DJing at festivals and doing EDM was something that just wasn't fulfilling for me and my soul project, my personal project. Right. And I'm glad that I followed the path. It was hard and rough. And like sometimes I feel like I made the wrong choice, but I'm doing what my heart is telling me to do. I think that at least it's honest, right? At least I'm doing yeah. what I need to be doing. Absolutely. And, and following the fun of it, which is something I talk about on this podcast all the time. I, I think this is maybe a good way to talk about your project with Gigi McGree. Yes. Because I, I was just watching some clips of, of you at uh, Hard Summer with her as Bad Boys Club because I hadn't I didn't really know what you guys were playing. I didn't really know what the, the sound was or the style was. So I just watched some clips and it was exactly what you were just talking about. I was just like, oh, they're just having a lot of fucking fun yes. up there. And you yes. could you could see it. You could hear it in the music. And there was something so refreshing about that to me where it didn't feel like, you know, your standard EDM act at a festival. It, it felt like, no, like we found the reason why we love this music and now we're yes. sharing it with you. And yes. regardless of whether it fits in or is the cool thing or, you know, I, you know what I'm talking about. Exactly. But, Absolutely. Yeah. How did that project come about? I mean, me and G have been friends forever and we both love house music. And we were sitting one day and I was just like, I have this, I was like, I just have this idea. I think we should just make a duo group. And she's like, absolutely. She didn't even like question it. She's like, absolutely. Yeah. She's like, should we house? And I'm like, absolutely house. Like we both just have this like, abs we love house music and we love DJing, but our sole projects were kind of going in our uh, in different directions from EDM. We didn't want to lose what we love and how we started. So like, let's just do what we, we we will do. Like, let's just do whatever we want to do that won't affect Cray. Because sometimes it's hard. If I say I want to make a house song, I can't as Cray now. Right. Right? Like I'm a live act now. Like I'm, all the music I've made for the past four or five years has been pop, electronic, alternative. So like for me to also then go to house would not make sense, right? Which would be too crazy for me going EDM to alternative to back to EDM. It just wouldn't make sense. So we were both like, let's just make the music we love to listen to. You know, because we yeah. both love house music. So we're like, and that's what we kind of just started. And Bad Boys Club was something that we just felt like we're both just like crazy fucking girls. And we're just like, we're sick of, you know, this like perfect idea about how, what a woman should be and what, you know, a girly should be. So we thought we'd just fuck the whole thing up and call it Bad Boys Club and just be this entity that anyone's welcome, by the way. That's the whole point. It's Bad Boys Club. If you're watching the set, you're a part of it. It's just like one of those things where we're trying to go up and then we're going to have a ton of fun. We're going to make really fucking fun music and we're going to be, we're going to make you laugh. Like half the point, <laughs> like we have a whole stick. It's a whole character. It's a whole thing. We oh, have like nun great. costumes on in our visuals. We just want to do something that's unique and that hasn't been done um, and just have fun with it. But we, so we can still DJ, but also still work on our soul dreams that are not DJing. So yeah. it's a really beautiful, like, Intro to both. No, I, I love that. That yeah, I, I'm I'm with you a hundred percent on those those defining principles. It, yeah. Do you think you and her? I, I don't know how you guys met or any of that, but do you think part of your connection with her is the fact that you're both sort of multi hyphenate, like singer, producer, DJs who are maybe a bit hard to pin down. Yeah, I mean, we just connected as friends. Like, we, we we have so much fun together. We're always laughing. It's always a shit show with us. And so we just felt like we were so alike 
in that way. And we are both just like, you know, we, we started this a, a long time ago, actually. Like, we've had this idea for so long and it didn't really come to fruition because we were so busy. But then COVID hit and we're like, we'll deposit now, but let's just still try to get it going. Like it just took a minute for us to get it because we've had this idea for so long. But once it happened, I feel like it just all made sense. Like once hard summer happened and our we, put our, we were putting our set together, having so much fun. It just like made sense. We made the music together with our producer friend, Nick, who just went and woo, who's incredible. And we nice. felt like it was just an awesome like think tank. We were just like making these amazing ideas and writing these hilarious songs, but really good. And we were just like, it just worked. And so we thought, let's just run with this and let's make it. Make it, yeah. Let's make it real. Do you, and we just, do you we think it's going to be a continuing thing? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We we want the whole year to be... We, we, we love Bad Boys Club. It's so much fun. And like, you know how easy DJing is. I'm not saying it's not hard, but like <laughs> showing up with the USB with your best friend, it's a pretty fun time, you know? Right. And we're pretty lucky to be able to do that. And I think we both just love doing that. Nice. And and yeah. uh, are you thinking new music as well? For Oh, yeah. We have Bad two Boys songs Club? already coming out. We're slated. I can't say much about them other than they're really... We play them during our set. Um, so people are excited, but we have two songs coming out there. We have so much music. We have so much plan. We just like, it's, I love being in a project that's so much no pressure. I feel like it's very much like whatever you girls want to do. Like we plan our shoots two days before we show up in a, in a fucking white room. We plan this funny as fuck shit. We just do it. It's all improv basically. Right. But I, it works because it's just us. And we're really yep. excited to like bring it to more places. There's nothing better than working with your friends. You yeah. Know? And just make, it's easy, right? It's, just, it's not work. It's so much yeah, fun. Like you had so much fun on our summer. Yeah, it's literally not work. Like I, yeah, I started a project with a, a friend of mine recently who I hadn't connected with in years. And it's the same thing. It's not work. It's a, it's like, yeah, a it's, present. Exciting. it's a present. It's like, it's so nice. Like for so long, you think work is just one thing and it has to, ha- has to feel a certain way. There's a ceiling to the amount of fun Absolutely. you can have while you're working. And then, yeah, sometimes it's just a, a friend or somebody taking you out of your zone to make you realize Absolutely. that, yeah, we can Absolutely. literally do whatever we want. That's why we started doing this, right? Yeah. And like, I feel like Cray, the Cray Project at times feels like a lot of work because there's a lot of moving parts now, you know, with social media and too. And it's sometimes it's a little bit draining. And so yeah. it's really nice to kind of step back from that seriousness of Cray. And like, that's such just every move is so meticulous to just be with Bad Boys Club and do, just have fucking fun, play whatever the fuck we want, drink during our set. Like the pressure's off. And it's yeah. really nice to have that because I feel like I've never had that before. It's always been Cray. So serious. Each move matters, you know, like let's just, everything needs to be done correctly and perfectly. And now it's like really nice to just be able to escape from that and be like, we're just going to fuck shit up. We're just going <laughs> to have fun, play f- our favorite music and just be dumb. You know? Right. Well, yeah, I, I was going to ask you how how your relationship with social media is going these days, because I remember the last time we talked, we we talked for a while about just how much time really being active on social media takes the fact that it can, you know, it's just stressful by its mm. nature, like in order yeah. to present yourself as carefree and having fun on social media, you're actually very stressed out and, you know, overworked to do it. Has your relationship with social media changed over the last few years? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I've always been this way. I Cray and Cheney are the same person, right? Like, I, I don't have a persona, you know, Cray's my nickname since I was a kid. My family calls me Cray still. So it's like, what you see is what you get on my social media. I'm a very honest, I'm a very blunt, I'm a very opinionated person. And I feel like, for me to, to make social media carefree and fun is for me just to be myself and to post whatever the hell I want to post. So I got to this point where I was like, you know, having a schedule and like doing all this stuff and caring about likes, caring about all this type of stuff. I was just over it. Um, I was just too much work. It was just too much work to care so much about something that is me authentically anyway. So I was like, I'm just going to do social media how I would do it if I was making no money. Right. right? I'm just going to do it what feels right. I'm going to do that. And I feel like that made it so much easier for me and so much more authentic for the fans. Like, you know exactly what you're getting. If you're a Cray fan and you stand by me and you read my shit, you know exactly what I believe in. You know exactly what I'm about. You know, like, I just am going to post how I'm going to post. Cheney's going to post. It's a personal, basically, account for me. I, I, it's right. hard for me to make it so serious. It's just not how I roll. Um, and it was just too exhausting for me to kind of like, be scared to post stuff because I was like, is that too shady or is that too... Well, I'm one and one, right? right. I, whatever Cray post, I'm the same person. So I just got <laughs> to the point where I was like, I'm just going to do shit how I would normally in my daily life. That's not a job. I'm just yeah. going to do that. And that made it 
way more fun and way more of a joy for me because now I actually enjoy social media and I look forward to it because it's something that's authentic to me now. I don't care about it. If anyone wants advice on how to do social media, do exactly what's authentic to you because that's what will show. It shows... I know the artists who have a social media team doing it for them. It's very obvious. You it know, like that, obvious. And that's, and that's, There's no hate on that. If you want, want to do it, don't fucking do it. But you can see who's... You you can see who you're giving your money to, right? Certain people you know, like this is the this is Cheney. She believes in this. She likes this. She's very honest. This, I'm not going to get a surprise. She's not going to get canceled by, from some secret shit back in the day. Because <laughs> look at her, she's yeah. just out there. Like she's already here. Right. So it's like, I, I want people to have that like calmness when they look at my shit. Because I know during quarantine, I didn't follow some people who I just I wasn't feeling I was like minded with, and it wasn't making me happy. Certain people, I, you just like you have to cut the fat. You know, you're like this is just not healthy for me to look at. Yep. I feel like that's something to, that's okay. The mute fe- the mute feature is very a beautiful feature. Oh, I use absolutely. it so much, right? Oh. I mute everybody that I don't need to see, and I feel like COVID gave me that time to like look through my following, who I want to support, who I want to be around, who I want to see, what's making me feel better, what's making me feel worse, and kind of just like. That's why I kind of modeled my life, my shit as. I really want someone to look at my page and be like, wow, I know that Cheney's, this song is authentic to Cheney. She wrote this because of this and this and this. She's selling this product. She's promoting this product. That must mean she really fucking likes it because Cheney doesn't fuck around. Cheney's not posting bullshit products. She's not posting every day. You know, like I really want to get to a place where you can trust what I'm putting out there. It's authentic and real and not some money bullshit, social media fucking fit tea bullshit. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I definitely know what you yeah. mean. I, were you always like before before Cray as the project and and before any of that? Were you always you know at, super active on social media? Were you always like a, a just just out there person? Like where does where does that come from? You know, because I think not everyone can sort of just be themselves online that easily. And I'm not saying I mean, it's easy, but you know what I oh, mean. Oh, no, no. Yeah. I totally get what you're saying. I mean, I think... I, I mean, I say this all the time. I've been a therapist since I was 11 years old. I got to a point in my life where I really just truly accepted who I am as a person. Flaws and all, because we all have flaws. You know, my list is long. And I feel like I just got to a point where I really, really just sat down and I realized I love myself. You know, I, I got through things that I wasn't, I, was, I wasn't able to get through. I accepted myself and things, my flaws. I really got to a point where I'm just like, you know what? I'm proud of who I am and I'm not going to take so much time and work to contrive this perfect social media, this, this persona of me because it's not me. And that's to me exhausting. Um, and I know that I don't like the pages that I follow that, that I used to follow that were like that, where this perfect lifestyle, this perfect idea. And then I met them in real life and a whole different life change, a whole, it was not even the same. Right. I want people to look at my shit and relate. I want people to know that, you know, what matters in life, like mental health. I want people to know that, people with followers are not some higher being. I don't, I don't want anyone to think that that means value. I really want someone to come to my page and be like, I know what I'm reading is authentic. It's honest. I don't like her or do I like her? Whatever the fuck you do, because you don't have to like me. At right. least you know it's real, right? At least you know what you're getting. And that's just, to me, I think social media is so filled with fluff and filled with these bullshit things that are not healthy. And I really want to try to combat that with being authentically me as possible. So you know exactly what the fuck is up and maybe you can relate. Maybe you can be like, Oh, I feel the same way, whatever the fuck it is. I want to be there for that person. Right. And I feel like social media is so used to this bullshit, like contrived. Well, like, because it's been stuff. monetized, right? Exactly. Like, exactly. And exactly. you can't tell what's real or not anymore because exactly. people are trying to do it and people are doing it as jobs now. Right. And so it's, yeah. Yeah. And I'm really, I'm, I, I'm really careful on what jobs I take. I'm really careful. I mean, you can look through my social media now and the sponsored posts you see are stuff I actually use and like in my daily basis. I'm never going to do a fit tea. Right. I'm never going to do things that I don't believe in because I want to create a space where people go, oh, I know Cray. She's posting that. She means it's legit. Not, oh, that could be really bad for me. Like she needs to be making money off that. I don't, I don't want that because I feel like that to me, I hate that when I see that. So I just want to be myself. And I never was on social media as a kid. I mean, I had a Blackberry. I'm from Canada. So like, <laughs> I think I got late to the iPhone game. I got it in like my third year in college when everyone had them. I, I was a very much a BBM girl. Um, and I, you know, I had Instagram, but like, I was posting photos of nothing. You know, I didn't really care about it. It wasn't really important. I know it's really a Facebook person either. And I think that, you know, it just got to a point where when I started putting out music as Cray, 
that's when social media really, you know, came into play that it mattered. Like, cause I didn't really care about it. I didn't have to take photos. I didn't give a shit about that type of shit. I was right. always taking photos because I wanted to be a photographer at one point and I was always posting on Facebook. I wanted, that's all I wanted to do. But other than that, I feel like Cray is the only catalyst that made me go, okay, now I need to do social media. Mm. You know, like that's kind of when it started. And like, same with Twitter. Like, I feel like I, I, was, I was never really on Twitter as a as a growing up. Like, I don't think that just hit my like demographic, I guess. But like, right the minute EDM happened in my life was the minute Twitter like was important. Right. And so I started being like, okay, I guess I'm going to start putting time into this because this is the only way for me to connect with my fans. I've never had this, you know, SoundCloud, we couldn't really DM at the time. Back in the day, it wasn't really a thing. So I was like, this is the only way for me to connect with my fans is through Instagram or Twitter. So I guess I'm going to have to get on that train. Right. You know, and it, you know, and here we are today with Instagram and TikTok. I'm trying to TikTok. I feel so old. <laughs> you know, I'm trying. I'm going on there. I'm like doing my authentic shit. I'm like, I can never do those dance trends and shit. I cannot sucker down to that. Yeah. It just doesn't feel authentic to me at all. Yeah. But you know, it's a, every day there's something new and I feel like I'm 28, you know, and I'm like, I'm, I'm not old, but like TikTok is like my sister. She's 16. That's right. her demo. She's like this day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Snap, Snapchat. I'm like, I don't even own Snapchat. Of course. You know? So it's like interesting to see the, just the tra- what sticks and what doesn't yeah, and yeah. what's important and what's not. And, and to me, what's exciting, even if you don't end up participating in the new trends, like, it's just exciting because it, you know, with each new iteration, whether it's TikTok, whether it's Triller, whether whatever it is, you know, Clubhouse, et cetera, et cetera, like it, all of those just, it like upends whatever the last thing was and yeah. messes everybody up and kind of yeah. for a second, like evens the playing field and all these, you know, new people or new personalities or new ideas all of a sudden are able to like just come out of nowhere. That to me is is super exciting. And it, yeah. it actually makes me wonder because you, you know, we talked about how you, you dabble in a bunch of different things. Obviously one thing that, that rose a lot in the pandemic was the intersection of music and gaming. Right. And, you know, we're seeing like a uh, Minecraft music festival or marshmallow playing in Fortnite or, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever it is. And it, all of a sudden that was happening so much because every DJ was just sitting at home. Is that something like, is that exciting for you? Is that something, do you see a future in that? Or do you look at, at that as more of kind of a, well, this is what we were doing because we were all at home and maybe now it'll go off and be a bit more separate again. I think that live streaming music is a, is a gift and not something to be monetized. If I'm being honest, I think that the option, I think every festival show should have a live stream option because there is a group of people in this world who do not want to go. Yeah. Um, and I think that like, even for me, like I have so much more empathy for people who don't want to go to sh live shows because now there's half of me who doesn't want it to go either. So I think that there should be an option forever now that show should be recorded and, um, I think it should just be a gift though. I don't think it should be monetized. I feel like that's where we get into this sticky sl slope where like I got like 200 offers probably in the year for doing live stream oh, and only sure. one was paid. <laughs> and only one was paid and it was barely paid. I did it because I thought it was cool. But like, I'm just thinking like there's no money to be made there. Right. Um, or it's just harder to get there. Yeah. But I think it's a beautiful thing for people to be included still. And there could be other options. Maybe there's could be other type of monetary things in that within that. But I think that the option should be for everyone to live stream. I think it's a, it's a really cool experience, you know, but I don't think it's ever going to replace live events. Absolutely not. I think, you know, it was a, it was a cool thing during a uh, lockdown. And I think it'd be, it's cool to continue for sure, but it's not something that could ever replace live shows. You know that like just yeah. oh, financially, it's just, there's no, there's no money in the game for anybody. Yeah. But I think it's a really cool thing. Like I would always want to live stream my tours. That, that would be the dream one day because I think there's a big audience of people who I want to include who don't want to go, don't live here, can't afford it, whatever. I want to include those people in any way I can. So like, it's, I still think it's a really cool asset and I think it's a really cool thing. I just don't think it's ever going to replace live music. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, financially, you're right. And there's all, and then just like energy wise to, yeah. you know, there's, there's the, the live streams are incredible. And I think scratched an itch. Maybe I didn't even know I had, but it's not the same as being on stage. It's not the same as being in a crowd with physical people. No. There's, yeah, there's there's definitely no replacing so just, that. Yeah, it's just a, just a disconnect there, right? Like, you have watching um, comedians talk about it and they were doing some, they did some like 
Zoom shows. Right. And they said it was so rough not hearing the laughter because it's what you feed off, what builds you, what gives you that confidence, right? Yeah. Same with live, like live streaming. Like, I didn't even watch my live stream because I was just like so nervous to even see chat because I was like, I don't even want to deal with that shit. You know, like <laughs> just a different ball game, which I don't think it's bad. I think it's really awesome. I think it's something that we should just, it's like, you know, Lala did their Hulu live stream. I think that's really cool. I think they should continue doing that. I would love that. Yeah. I would love that if all the festivals. I turned it on and we watched all day and ate dinner. We watched it all day. I thought it was super cool. Like that's to me is really cool, but I don't think it's like some intertwining big deal. I think it should just be like a cool thing offered because why not show everyone in the world who can't make it or can't afford it or can't, can't be there or can't cause of COVID, whatever the fuck it is. I think we should give those people a chance to be able to include themselves. Yeah. hundred percent. And even from a business perspective, I mean, I can't, it cannot be that expensive to just set up a few cameras oh. on your stage yeah. and, and set up a stream. And yeah, I, I would love for every festival to just do yeah. that as, yeah. yeah, as kind of a standard. I mean, it makes me think of what we're talking about now. So when you were on the podcast three years ago, we were talking about how you first got into dance music and you were talking about this, this Dead Mouse concert you went to yeah, that was like, yes. that was like a life changing uh, yes. event. And, and for, by the way, for anybody watching this right now, anybody listening back, uh, you got to go back and listen to the, the first Cray episode on the back to back podcast. That's the whole. That's the whole backstory. That's the whole yes. hero's journey. But uh, yeah, that you know that concert, right? This Dead Mouse concert that is mind blowing and opens your world to a whole new sound and community and all this kind of thing. Like, does that feeling? Can you still get that feeling somehow? Like, what is what is exciting for you now in what you do? What you know? How do you connect to music and art that deeply these days? I think it's honestly just I'm writing from pure heart and soul experience. You know, like I'm really like every song I wrote, like I did my EP, I wrote about how I was heartbroken. I mean, hate broke up. Like I really, th that's how I connect now. The wow factor for me is being able to re have anyone relate with what I, what I wrote. Cause what I wrote is truly coming from my heart. Like I write every song I put out. Um, and to me, that is the wow factor is being able to, see my words help somebody or see my experience help somebody or help someone not make the same mistake I did or whatever that that to me is so powerful when I see someone in the crowd say your song helped me get over my breakup your song did this your song did that. that to me is the wow factor and it gives me chills you know that to me makes it everything worth it it's just being able to say like wow my pain or my struggles has helped someone else that's the biggest gift you know the biggest gift for sure like of course you know I've been in this industry for a long time and I've seen every act 20 times. So it's hard for me to go to a festival and be like, wow, you know, there's right. certain acts I really want to see still like, you know, like lane eight, I'm really trying to look forward to see oh, and lane like bring me the horizon. I'm really into right now. Like there's these few people that I'm like really stoked about. Like I really want to see Stevie Nicks. I haven't seen her ever. She's my favorite, whatever it is. But there's that, that like that shocking feeling from watching dead mouse when I was 16. I don't think I'm ever going to get that again, but I think that's okay. Cause I think that was really a special moment for me to, be introduced to this new genre and be completely shocked, right? Like I was just so taken back. I was young. I barely experienced anything. I was used to my small little box. So like that was just one of those experiences opened me up. And I feel like now I'm just getting glimpses of that and everything I do now. Right. You know, I'm getting inspired by other acts. I'm getting inspired by things I'm seeing and things I'm feeling. But I feel like that one experience is something that's just maybe going to be that one. I feel like that's special for that moment, you know? And yeah. like I have certain shows, of course, blow me away and I'm like crying, but like, that introduced me to my my life, you know, like that introduced me to EDM and got me on this train. So I was like, I'll feel like that forever moment needs to stay in its pristine state and just be there. I kind of <laughs> like that. Yeah. Maybe that's part of, you know, we were talking earlier about uh, being ambitious and chasing these goals kind of at the exclusion of other things in our lives. Because I've absolutely had moments like that too, right? That just rearranged my brain yes. and, and gave me chills, whatever it is. And it's almost like when you're, you tell me if you, if you feel me on this, but it's almost like when you see that those feelings are possible, right? And you see that something this meaningful to you can exist, even if it's just like a flash of it and it goes away and you never see it again in your life. I think that's maybe part of what drives us to keep doing this yeah. is like the hope that we'll find it again somewhere, yeah. you know? Or that I could be that for somebody. Yes, yes, yes. You know, like to me, like I have so many, like my Twitch fan, my Twitch babies say, this is my first festival or my first show. You got me into EDM and now I'm a huge 
fleur baby and i'm like that's like beautiful right that's like that's like the goal for any artist is to just like show someone something new and have it be your new obsession i think it's incredible and you know like and now like each day i just i try to live it one by one i try to get inspired i try to really to live in the moment because i feel like covid t- took a lot of things away from us um and it made me really want to sit down and be like yo life is really like this can go in an instant if the only way i'm making money is touring I kind of want to rechange that. I kind of want to think about, sit down and really think about my life. I don't want to be dependent on something that can easily be taken away right. my entire life. I was on unemployment, right? So like it went from being fucking crazy, flying all the time, buying whatever the fuck I wanted to we're going to be on unemployment. We're going to let's go get some fucking coupons and let's try to really, <laughs> right. you know, save our rent. Like we literally moved to pay less rent. Like, you know, like that, it got it to me a shock. Right. And it really made me realize that I was so privileged. I was living this privileged lifestyle that I was just like, everything was going to work out. No. Yeah. Now I really want to plan and really want to be smart about my life and my money and my my time. Well, can we talk a little bit about that as far as just the actual realities financially of being an artist? And like what as much as you are comfortable talking about, like what have you changed to try to get that security and that balance in your career? I mean, absolutely. This is the first time ever, actually, like three days ago that I'm debt free. Oh, what? amazing. Congratulations. That's right. Yeah, that's huge. I always feel like I was living my life. Um, I was I made I made I made, I made some, mis- some mistakes and I trusted the wrong people on my team and I was being an artist. I was so in the artist space, doing art, being creative. I wasn't looking at the business side of my things, which is something that I've learned very heavily that I needed and I, I turned around and one day I just realized that I had no money. Right. And I was like, oh, but I was making so much money. I was like, where's it all going? I was going back into the project, back into the project, back into this, back into that, back into over here, into this, into this. And I'm sitting here like, whoa, 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 whoa. And then COVID hit. And I'm sitting here like, holy shit. So I hired a new business manager who's an amazing woman, like my basically my grandma. I call her all the time. And I said to her, I'm like, this is what I need. I need to save money. I want to be debt free. That's it. I'm, I'm like, you tell me what I need to do. Because I'm so bad with money. I'm so bad with numbers. I'm so, I'm so not in that space. I've never been in that space. I'm like, tell me like a, what you tell a five-year-old <laughs> right. on how to <laughs> save and what to do. And so she gave me all these amazing tips. I have like this diary now that I write. If I want something that's like fun, I write it down. And a week later, if I still really want it and it's meaningful to me, then I can budget it out. But if I, I mean, some, most of the time I go, ah, why? that was just an in the moment thing. Yeah, I don't even yeah. know why I needed that. That's smart. So I, yeah. So I'm really trying to do that. Also for tour wise, like, you know, I'm buying the shittier flights because I want to save money. I don't care about being in first. I don't care where I'm sitting. I usually buy, you know, like the cheapest flight possible. I always on my meal. I Before I, meal vouchers, I never really gave a shit about. I'd go right. do my own thing. Now I actually budget out with my tour manager and we spend the meal voucher instead of going over. Yeah, 100%. So those are things that I'm really caring about and like really trying to give a shit about and groceries. I'm like, I, I'm, I have some coupons and shit. I'm just like trying to be more conscious as a person, because I feel like I was just so in this like lifestyle where I was just like, oh, I'm a DJ, like, oh, I'm killing it. But I had no money. Right. I had none. So oh, the yeah. lifestyle that everyone thinks like, oh, you have everything, you have everything. Social media means nothing. I was really, really broke and I had to borrow money in COVID. Well, so it's it, like one of those things yeah. where I just want people to know the reality that we're right here. And I right? was going to say, you're not alone in that, right? Like, exactly. and, and I know you know that, but I mean, it's people would be astounded at how many of their favorite artists are basically broke. Or living with their parents still, or having like six roommates, or like this like lifestyle that you think. I mean, it's easy because it's social media, and that's why I really try to post stuff that's not always so awesome and not so contrived. And like that's why I try to post when I'm sad, or when I have no makeup on, or when this is a mess, or when I try to because I don't. I'm so sick of this narrative that like everything's amazing if you have followers. Like you're famous and you're rich and you're designer and you. Uh, it's not like that at all, right? It's not. Like, it's all contrived. Like even when yeah. people say like, "Oh, you have so much designer," usually it's just for a shoot. Usually someone brings it, I put it on for the outfit and it's not mine. Or like, there's just so many secrets that like, or like just things that are hidden to like dampen this lifestyle. Because of <laughs> course it looks great when you have Rolexes on and you're partying and you're on first class. It looks awesome. But is it real? Yeah. No. You know, a lot of the time it's not. So I wanted my fans to know that I'm going through the exact same thing that they're going through right now. I am unemployed and scared and we have to move out because I can't afford the rent and all this stuff that are happening where I was like, I really want to be honest because I know people feel alone because I felt alone with who I was following. I felt like I was the only one struggling. Yeah, I saw people partying still, saw people on PJ still and peak COVID and not giving a fuck. And to me, it really made me feel like shit. So I kind of just re 
shifted myself to focus on people who are like-minded, make me feel good, make me feel safe. And for myself to make me a better person and not be so pressured to this, have this perfect lifestyle and look so cool and perfect online all the time. I, I like this a lot. I, I like what you're saying because so often my conversations with people end up kind of being like, how can we how can we use social media the least and still survive our careers? But what you're talking about is actually leaning into it, but just do it, figuring out a way to make it healthier for yourself. Absolutely. I, at the end of the day, I think that's actually maybe a, a smarter idea than than what I do half the time, which is really yeah. just, you know... Because, yeah, I follow a million people who post stuff that doesn't make me feel good. You know, a lot of times it's an obligation to me. Like, I don't enjoy using social media. And it's I, I like what you're saying, because sometimes that's all it really is, is just adjusting your perspective on something. Sometimes that's Absolutely. all it takes to to make it work in your life. Like create who I was following and what my news feed looked like pre-COVID and what it looks like now is so drastically different. Like before it was superficial LA lifestyle, bougie, 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 Instagram models, like pieces, like just, it was just that lifestyle designer, rich, blah, 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 blah. And I got to this point where I was like, this is making me feel like shit because a, I am broke and I'm sad and I'm unemployed and I'm sick and I'm tired and ill. And this, the, the heaviness of the world was just, I was like, what the fuck? I literally unfollowed everybody and refollowed what I wanted to follow. And now my page is something that really brings me happiness. I follow a lot of joke accounts. I follow a lot of self-love accounts. I follow a lot of mental health accounts. I follow new artists that give me new perspective, smaller artists to see what they're doing. I, I feel like I'm now, I have a, I'm really inspired when I go on social media. And when people tell me, how do you do this career? Like, I don't even like social media. Oh, how do you do it so much? I go, I do it when it's authentic to me. Right. I do exactly what makes sense to me. I don't have that pressure on it where I have to do social media as a job. It's a job. Of course it's a job. But at the end of the day, I do it what feels right. And what, what I want to do in the moment, I don't think about it. I don't have a plan. I don't, I don't, I used to do that. And that, that's what made it unfun. So if you are struggling with social media and you don't get it and you're like, oh, it's such a job for me, maybe switch your perspective and stop focusing so hard on being this artist and be yourself. Right. At the end of the day, your fans love you. Yeah. You know, like they, they want to see more about you. They want to feel closer to you. They want to see what you believe in because they could probably believe in the same thing. You can inspire those people. And I know it's hard sometimes because you giving your whole self is a lot. Like there's a lot of things that keep private still. That's good. Oh, I yeah, I was gonna ask. That. Yeah, of course. But it's hard though for me because I'm I'm constantly just do I'm just like giving. I'm not even thinking because I just I just I'm letting it just flow right out. And sometimes I have to check myself and think. And sometimes Hayden goes, you know what? Keep that memory private. I go, good job, you're right. Hmm. So like sometimes I have that moment where I'm like, chill. You don't have to be too cra- do too personal online. But it just feels so much easier when you just are yourself and you just it's not so thought out and so perfect right. it's, it's just better you know like your fans do want to see that you struggle too sometimes it's really hard to see an artist never struggle it's hard for me to connect with one of my favorite artists if they're always perfect happy everything's great i'm Absolutely. like damn like how is this connecting to the music that they're writing how is this real you know it's hard for me well and i think sure. some people you know curate what they post in order to make it appeal to like the maximum number of people right which i right. get but then you know those people people, if you ever do want to be real, you know, how many of those people are going to follow what you're going to do as opposed to maybe you maybe you are very authentic for a smaller number of people who follow you. But those people, I mean, that's a that's a lifetime. Right, exactly. That's a lifetime connection. Absolutely. And that's, I feel yeah. like it's really important. And you know, there's a part of me that wishes that, you know, I had wore a helmet and no one knew who I was. Of course, <laughs> of course, you know, I get, I, get, I have crazy DMs every day. I get crazy stuff happens to me in public. It's, I, of course, but at the end of the day, all I want to do is be authentic to myself and I want it to be easy and I want it to be natural and I want it to be something that bring, brings me joy. And if it doesn't bring me joy, then I, that's when I have to rethink and think what I want to do, you know, this is what I want to do. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, on on that note, you know, we were talking about the, the all the new music. You were saying you have a bunch of stuff lined up to yes. put out. I mean, what if there's any part of that you can talk about at the moment? Like, what do you have planned? What should people be looking out for? I have so much music. Like, you know, just getting on top of my label and me aren't the best of friends, but we're trying to get to a place where we can put on my music. But, you know, it's all you guys know me. It's all authentic alternative, pop punk, fun, cray music. It's all chanty. It's all super cool. It's something that just speaks to me. 
Um, you know, these songs are all just, it's just very cray. You're going to laugh. Like, it's just very cray. It's, it's, I, that's how I explain it. It's a lot of like creepy, horror stuff involved, but super some satire because I love being funny. It's a lot of just that. And, you know, the summer is kind of building on that and getting that ready for the fall. Because I think start temp- September starts, that's c- kind of when I want to start putting music out and getting it back and getting this into this whole year. And then nice. next year, live shows, you know, I'm going to take a break off DJing after this small tour. After September, I think I'm going to take a break off DJing because that's never what I really want to do. And I'm really going to focus on bringing that live aspect back and probably next, probably 2023. Is that what? 2022? 2022, 2022, 2022 next year? Yeah. That's when I'm gonna start doing a lot of my live stuff. I love it. I, I saw some videos when I knew I was coming to talk to you. I, I saw a video of your, I think it was your LA live show that you did yes. pre-pandemic. And I mean, it, the production on that was really cool. It was yes, like, I'm broke. I was broke, by the way. <laughs> right. I, I wish I would have known what was going on. I was okaying stuff when I shouldn't have been. That's another thing that I was doing that's not good. I was like, come on with a barrier. Make it the best show ever, of course. And then yeah. I turn around, no money and debt, whatever. I mean, but it did look cool. It, it was so cool. <laughs> it was something that really, it made me believe what I was doing. Mm. It really made me go, this is what I want to do. I yeah. love live. You know, if after that, if I said, oh, I didn't really like that, I would have probably shit my pants. But right. after it made sense to me, it made sense to the fans, sold out the show. It just made me feel really good. Did, had you done, I forget if we had talked about this before, but have you done live performance stuff like earlier in your life? Were you in bands when you were younger? Anything like that? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how like, when people have these beautiful, I was watching this movie the other day, I forgot what it was called. It was this beautiful story of this artist of how she like, you know, uh, singing with her dad in a band when she was three years old. And this right. cool, beautiful. And I saw so Hayden. I'm like, yo, that does, that's like, I have none of that. Like, I literally just stumbled into music. I'm like, for better or for worse, here I am now, you know? And that's why like, I, I'm not the strongest singer, but I'm practicing every day and I'm trying to build my voice and I'm trying to get better guitar and better. I'm like really trying to like, become a better artist now in my in my 28 years old right um and i never really had that before but i feel like that's just a part of my journey and a part of maybe gives you guys hope that if you don't have to be a born bred musician you don't have to have this talent right away you know it can grow it can grow with you and that's totally granted you're you're just there no comparison what, no one's better or worse what was the what was the first time you remember performing in any sense of the word like it, whether it was young whether it was like Oh, well, I used to do dances. My, my okay. sister, my sister is, um, she was a ballerina. So when growing up, we always put on performances and I used to love, I've always loved music. Music has been my, my saving grace for like everything I've done, even in like my learning disabilities in school, I always had headphones on listening to music and I loved music. So my, um, my dad got me a big boom box for Christmas, um, with all the CDs, like black eyed peas, like to let the dogs out, right. cat, all that type of stuff. Yep. So I would just all basically... The all the bangers. I basically just make dances and sing along to that in front of my family. Like it was like some big production. Obviously it wasn't. <laughs> but that's why, I, that's why I started like loving music and like performing and singing and screaming. And like that was really fun for me. And, you know, growing up in Vancouver, I was 19. I was working in the music scene there. So I was always doing guest lists or all those type of club promotion stuff. I was always around DJs. Um, and then I started like, you know, Avicii. I went to a Avicii show and it blew my mind and I was crying. I was just so, so special. And then I went to my first show, Dead Mouse, Calvin Harris. At, it was huge in Vancouver. And I remember just being like, as you know, I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> and then after that, though, I went to, I, I moved to California for college. And so I kind of lost that spark. And no one really, de- no one was really into EDM as much as I was in college. Like I was going to the Yost Theater when none of my friends would go. I'd go to like Dirty Audio, like back in the day, like three people were there, right? Like the day one shows, you know, I was oh, yeah. there. I was like stoked. I was going to see like every like Uzi back in the day, like Bro Safari. Like, I was in all those, Liquid Stranger. It's a weird, weird coincidence, but I played the opening night of the Yost Theater. Like the <laughs> the very Dude, first I probably night. was there. <laughs> Straight up. I was I was like a Yoast person. I was there every night for EDM night. I was there. The Yoast like, was and, amazing. Yeah. It was I loved it. I, I, I was loved DJing it. for Kid Sister at the time and they yes. they were literally building the stage. There was like a yes. I'm not even exaggerating. There was a crane on stage. Yes. Like in the background, they were still building it while we were playing. It was the weirdest thing. I remember be going there for Excision or I think it was Liquid Stranger or something on Valentine's Day. I wasn't really a fan of Dubs at the time, but I just loved EDM. So I was like, I just wanted to go. And like, I remember like the roof, parts of the roof were like falling off <laughs> yeah, yeah, into yeah. the crowd. And we had like roof dust all over us. I love um, how how janky that place was. Oh, I love it. It was so <laughs> janky. It was so janky. I also used my fake ID to get in every time. Oh, nice. So I was drinking, I was drinking always there but like i feel like that gave me that 
that drive. I always wanted to be a part of it. You know, I've always wanted to be a part of music, but I never knew how. I don't think I didn't think I had the confidence back then to say I'm going to be an artist. Mm. I didn't think I had that and self that self love yet. Um, I was just like, oh, I'll be behind the scenes. I'll just work with them. You know, I'm I'm a fan. And and I got to that point where I just started being like, yeah, I think maybe I can try this out. Like just 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 because like while I'm doing other things, and I felt kind of lone, lonely in college. So there wasn't really a scene there, and I felt like I was craving. So I was always going back to Vancouver and going to Blueprint Faded Nights, and I was going to all those like underground like trap nights and that's where my heart lied and I was like I'm just gonna try it fuck it and it came into fruition but you know slowly after like making trap music I started realizing that like that wasn't my home and I wanted to use my writing but then writing didn't really work with EDM music so I was kind of lost and then I just thought my mom sat me down she goes you know what you already did all this you already went off the beaten path right so continue on it you know just write do whatever the fuck you want you don't owe anyone anything if you don't want to DJ, don't DJ. I just don't. So I was so like, I was like, oh, I can't lose like this my career. Like yeah, I can't well, whatever. You work just, to build it already, yeah, right? Like, yeah. Right. And people are calling me crazy. And a lot of managers call me crazy. Why would you change lanes right now? Why would you, you're a me? You're right now on festival lineups, and yeah. you're going for it. And now you want to change and not do trap music. You're crazy. I kept going called crazy all the time, and then I was like, I but I can't. It was not my heart doesn't lie there anymore. I don't want to produce anymore. I got overproducing. It just wasn't my passion. I was getting tired. Right. And I wanted to write and I wanted to sing. And so I was like, I'm just gonna fuck it. I, I didn't listen to anybody as I always do. My mom says you'll never listen to anybody but yourself. It's true. <laughs> if you tell me to do something, I won't do it. So I literally was like, you know what? Fuck it. But you I'm listen to her, write. right? I mean, that's good advice. Yes. yes. She knows me very well. So I was like, you know what, fuck it. I'm just gonna do whatever I want to do. And if fans don't stay and the fans don't like it, I'll get new fans. Mm. You know, at that point I was small enough where it wasn't paying my bills. You know, it wasn't like I was like on main stage, right. you know, I wasn't. So I was like, I'm still small enough. And I feel like my fans will still rock with me if I just do this transition. So like it took like three years, but I did a slow transition where I did like house music with my lyric, a top line on it. I did like a EDM song with my top line on it. Like I, and I kind of slowly transitioned out to a space where no one was upset. I gained new fans and like my old fans like still rock with me because they were still like, it just was, it, it worked out yeah. the way I did it. Like I tell everyone, if you want to transition out, do it, just do it with love and with honesty and slow. Like, don't just go tomorrow. I'm making house music. Sure. I would just be like, Hey guys, this is what I'm really inspired by. And start putting it out, make a mix series, make a full, just like start doing what you want to do while doing your other shit. And at one point it'll just but, be. Yeah. And, and the beauty of that, I mean, we kind of touched on this earlier too, but you know, you, you actually forged your own lane. Right. And once you, once you really do that, which again, takes time and frustration and so long, uh, you know, et cetera, it's all that. But once you do it, nobody else is in your lane. Right. So yeah, and all that people the- ask me all the time. They're like, how do you, I want to do what you did. They're like, I want to get out of EDM and do live. I'm like, well, buckle up. Okay. I'm like, buckle up, <laughs> buckle up right in there. I'm like, Hey, I'm glad that you're following your dreams because you should follow your heart. Cause I know a lot of artists who are too Two up here that can't change, sure. right? You know, yeah. even that whole getter thing like broke my heart. Oh man, um, yeah, I think it I, hurt it a lot of people. I mean, I'm, I know it hurt him, but I think it hurt a it lot of people me, watching it. Made me it. hate EDM. Like it made me actually like piss. I was like, I can't believe you're making this man stick to something that he doesn't want to do anymore, and you're not showing them respect of just letting him do his art, right? Like that to me was like so. Um, that to me, I was scared. I was like, what if this happens to me, right? I was like, right. this is I'm doing this. I think a lot of um, people were scared. Yeah, like every artist was like, now, like, I still see it where people can't do what, like, what they want to do. And to me, that's fucking bullshit. And I'd rather be broke doing what I want to do than trying to make every single person happy. I don't give a shit. If you like my, when I made trap music, come to my DJ, DJ shows. I play a lot of trap still. I play all my old bangers still. That's my vibe. If you don't like my new shit, then don't listen. And that simple as that. And if you like my live shit, come to my live shows. Don't go to my DJ sets. And that's, I kind of just want to stay open to everybody. Like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm always going to do me. I'm always going to be honest about it. So you can just choose your lane of what you want to, what you want to support today. Absolutely, and I, I think the lesson in there for for anyone up and coming who's thinking about this kind of stuff too is that it's it's always the scarier choice to go and do something that isn't proven that it works to yeah. go and do something where there isn't as much of a roadmap. Yeah. But making that choice a hundred percent of the time, like people, if you're the only one in your lane, if you're the only one on the path. There's nobody else to even consider in the conversation, yeah. right? So all of a sudden you have this totally unique identity that like earlier in the conversation, I was saying that it's impossible to define where you're at now, right? And I think that's that's like a power of strength. That's a, a you know, yeah. a you. powerful position to be in. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot for people to take from that. 
What what was just because I'm curious talking about when you were getting into shows? Do you remember the first show you played? First show I played. I mean, I I think I had it's like I think I had a few bullshit ones before, but the first real show I played was an exchange opening up for Crane um, at Doors. Um, yeah. Oh my god, I was shitting my pants. I was so fucking nervous. I made <laughs> um, Rob, my boyfriend at the time, Vincent. I made him sit and listen to my set like a hundred times. Okay, <laughs> I planned out every single thing. So I was so scared to show up there. I would never show up for my first show, just like winging it. No, I made an entire set list of like every song I wanted to play. And I made him listen to it a thousand times, and he taught me how to use CDJs because I was using Crack Tractor Pro before and I really wanted to be go to my first show like as like, I can go on some DJs. Right. I don't want to bring anything. So I was like, that's why I really practiced. I, I asked my mom for a loan to buy CDJs because holy shit, what a fucking investment oh my God. CDJs are. Unbelievable. So I was like, please, so I, I paid off that debt in like two years. But I finally, I got my CDJs. I got them used, whatever. I was practicing every day and I showed up and three, I was really scared because it was empty. But these three girls drove from Vegas all the way for my show. Oh, and that wow. made me feel so fucking... Her name's Taddy. I still follow her because I'm like, that made me feel so validated and so special. It really made me feel like I'm doing it. You know, like having those girls be like, oh my God, Cray, we came for you. And I was like, because there's literally <laughs> no one in there, right? It's like five people. I was doors, doors, you know, exchange of doors, no one's in there. Yeah. So I was so... Like, that really made me feel like I'm doing it. I was like, okay, like I can do it. Like and I loved it being, it was empty. So I was not as scared. Right. So that felt good too. And I got some photos of me DJing for the first time. So I was like, ah, I felt so cool. I was like, okay, but I was almost shit my pants. <laughs> and then after that, Anna Leno hit me up for her hyper house tour. And I literally shit my brains. out. I was so excited. Cause I was, I look up to her so much. She's incredible. Um, and, and I had an incredible lineup. I had Dombrowski on it. Miha had such a sick lineup. Me in Las Vegas. I was like, oh my God, I'm with legends. Yeah. I was like, I was like, I'm doing it. And that's when I, and also my first time back to backing was on that tour. And Anna goes, come back to back with us. And I literally go, I can't, I'm too nervous. And she goes, just back to back to us. Just do it. She goes, just do it. Just do it. So I literally go in and plug in. I, I do one song. I take a music. I go, I did it. And I ran off. <laughs> and she was laughing so hard. She's like, you did one song. That's all you got. She's like, back to back still counts. Hey. I was like, I yeah. still did it. It's a start. It's a start. It's a start. And I remember that just being like, and my mom being like, holy shit. Like, it was just like crazy touring so young. I was such, I was such a baby, you know? And I was like, my How eyes old were like, you then? I don't even know. It's like, it was so, I don't even know. I have to, you know what? I don't even know. Let me look. <laughs> Cause I that swear, was what, like 2014? Yeah. I think it was, I think it was back then, honestly. Cause I'm now I'm looking at all my photos. I got archive a lot of my photos. Right. But like my first show, I feel like I can show you the date on that. It was, Dude, I, sometimes my brain like, doesn't understand years. I'm yeah. like, I'm like, it was a couple of years ago. It's like 10. You're right, I'm like, yeah. someone asked me how long I lived in LA. I was like, oh, like five, six years. It's been like 12 years. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, okay. I'm like, my brain, I'm like, okay, Cheney. Like, let's also, people ask me when I graduate college. I have no idea. Or high oh, school. Yeah. I have no idea. Everyone <laughs> knows but funny. me. That's funny. I mean, I, yeah, I think the older you get, the worse that kind of thing gets. Like, I've definitely, I'm at the age now where sometimes I forget how old I am. <laughs> Same. Yeah. <laughs> or like when I was a kid, I was looking at 30 year olds and going, Ew, you're so old. And now I'm 28. Right. And I'm like, I'm not old. I don't yeah. feel old. Yeah, you're Am definitely old? not. <laughs> you're definitely not. But back in not. the day, I felt like I was old. I know. I know. I mean, it's great. Yeah. I, going too far down this road is wild. But, you know, in, in what we do, right, like DJing music, it's a young person's game. And the the crowds generally are always young, right? Yes. And so it, it's kind of like what you were talking about figuring out TikTok earlier. It's like you have to you have to be able to connect still, but at, you also have to be able to be like, well, maybe this part of it isn't for me. You know? Absolutely. No. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Looking at these shows. Oh yeah, the Anna Leno tour was in 2017. Oh, 17. I was way off. See? Okay. See, I thought that was later earlier too. Yeah. Crazy. That's crazy. It's so much has changed. Like I have like no tattoos. Like when I'm like I don't know if you can see. Oh, I, I can have, like, see a little bit. I have no tattoos. Oh wow, yeah, that's wild. <laughs> you look like a different person. <laughs> I know, I have blonde hair, and I was like, this is me. <laughs> but that Anna Leno tour was so special. I think that really, that really gave me the confidence to do it. Honestly, my first show here it is actually 2016 September 12th. Oh, amazing. Here she is. Oh, uh, there she is. Look at her. Baby Craig. Look at her. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> that, is, that is truly wild. I mean, I, and touring that early with people like Anna and Nina Las Vegas, who I think are also such great examples of 
kind of what we've been talking about earlier, where they they occupy this really unique space in what they do. And I don't think you can really compare them easily to anyone else. That must have been inspirational, like, at, you know, to start off around people oh, like that. Too. I, tell it, I say it's every interview I've ever had, like Anna really gave me that push that I'm, I can do it as a woman. Like she really did. Like she really gave me that inspiration. Like I'm like, this is someone I look up to. This is someone in my lane. This is someone who's like me, right? We're women here doing this. And it really gave me the validation that like I'm doing something cool because she fucking recognized that. And it really put me on the map and it helped me get to do show my first shows ever. And it really, really fucking helped me. Like I, I honestly say it all the time, like I'm so grateful for her. And I'm so, and she always does that. She always puts on the underground. She always puts on women. Like she is yeah. the pinnacle of a good person in this industry. And there's not a lot, you know, there really isn't. So she, I was yeah. so thankful for that. And then, you know, obviously touring with Sunny in Japan, like I get, told, I get, that's like my, like my crown on my career. Like I right. get asked that every time in an interview, it's like how, like you made it so early, like, right. Like, how did you do that? And I'm like, you know what? Right. I just happened. And it was such a blessing for me to tour a new place. It was my first time touring out of the country. And it was with Skrillex, someone who obviously uh, like is just the fucking person of all persons. <laughs> yeah, so, he's, he's definitely yeah. the person. <laughs> like, you know, so like be, and he was so kind and generous and gracious and he really believed in my shit. And that to me, that was blew my mind. I was like, this is fucking crazy. This is crazy. And I, get back, I came back from that, like, I'm fucking ready. And, I, and that actually gave me the, the, the dream. Because I look at Sonny and I saw how he was doing whatever the fuck he wanted to. And he really was sticking true to what his soul wanted to do. If he wanted to put out fucking reggae, if he wanted to put out rock, he was just doing it. Yeah. I was like, I want to do, I want to be able to do that. I was like, I don't want to bottleneck myself. I want to be able to do whatever my mind wants to create. And he really gave me that confidence to just do whatever the fuck I wanted. And right. he kept telling me, he's like, just, just do it. Just do whatever the fuck you want. Like, stop, stop caring. And I was like, yeah. you're right. Oh my God. And that's when I... Ab yeah, a hundred percent. And I mean, he's another great example of that, right? Where even now in 2021, he's doing whatever he wants to do. Exactly. And, yeah. and I, you know, it's like people are like, oh, well, he's Skrillex, you know, he can do anything. But it's like, okay, but look at what he's choosing to do. Like he could, he could just headline festivals for the rest of his life, making dubstep easy. He doesn't have to work. Call yeah. me, call me can just do whatever the fuck he wants. Right. Absolutely. And like, so look so at what he's choosing to do. And, you know, maybe that tells you something about why he got to where he got. Right. Yeah. And like, like when people are upset, like there's some records he put out that I didn't really like, but guess what happens? I say, I should really like that. Does it change my opinion on him? No. So right. already, like when fans get so personal, upset about certain things, about certain records, I'm like, he puts out so much music and you're going to care about this one song. Who gives a shit? On to the next. Like, you know, certain ones I'm like, oh, I don't really fuck with that. Move on. Do I right. just change my opinion on him? No. Of course Do not. I want to be? No. I'm just like, I just, like, that's why I hope more fans can see, like, if you want the most and the best out of your artist, your favorite artist, shitting on them for something that you don't like is going to make probably tarter their shit. It's probably going to make it worse. Like, I know for me, but if someone shits on my music, it makes me think like, damn, like maybe I should put it. It doesn't make me feel like, oh, I want to put more music out. It makes me feel worse. So like, if right. you don't like the song your artist puts out, on to the next. Because the next one you might like. If you start shitting on that person, it might really dampen their shit. And it might not put anything out you like forever. It made me wonder for you, and as you're kind of growing into whatever the next, the, the evolution of the Cray project is going to be, do you feel like you're, obviously, you know, you've, you've found the sound you want to make, you have all this music we've been talking about that's going to, you know, start dropping at some point. Do you feel like you as a songwriter, have you zeroed in? Has there been any kind of like light bulb moment? Like how has your songwriting changed in, in say the last year or two? I mean, it's changed because I'm in love now. So like that, I, you know, a lot of my old stuff used to be um, really like about my depression or heartbreak or sadness or love. And like, it used to be a lot about that. And I think I kind of, after I put that EP out, I kind of um, changed the tune of how, like, like I, I write a lot about my life. Like I'm very, I'm very personal about when I write. So like the changes in seasons, right? Like I was through that heartbreak season. I wrote all heartbreak and all songs about sadness and growing and changing. And then now I feel like I'm on this new wave where I'm, I'm really writing about like, fun punk rock like i'm in love but i'm goofy and I'm, I'm just a kid and like they're all like i'm getting more into that fuck the system like fuck everything like be yourself like now i'm in this whole like new evolution of cray where i'm like writing about truly loving myself and wanting people to know to love themselves and love their flaws and love their shit and just like all my stuff now is like chanty and gang vocally and like fun and like loud and like 
all about just like growth and change and acceptance. I feel like that's where I am right now as a songwriter. I'm kind of in this niche right now where I'm writing a lot about that. But it's always ever changing. Who fucking knows? You know, it's always changing. But I do, I I write every day and my kind of my system is I write before I, I sing. So I write all my lyrics out. I write the song out completely. Um, first is everything done. And then that's when I start thinking about what I think the song should be. And I write notes within that. So I'll be like, I think this should be gangy. I think it should be high dr- uh, hard drums. I think it should be guitar led. Like I write all that in my note and I take it to the session, whoever I'm with, you know, sometimes sure. I'm with no one. I'm just by myself. Sometimes I'm with a producer or someone with a writer. And that's why I take my idea and I'm like, let's bring this. I hear is basically the template for it. Let's fill it. Right. Um, and that's like, you know, like melody for me is not my strongest point. So I always love bringing in really good melody lyricists who come in. Cause like, I like the lyrics and I write everything else. And I kind of have the song in my head kind of produced out flesh a little bit. All I need kind of help with is some catchy melodies. It's hard for sure. me sometimes. So I write certain words that don't sing really well. So like I have like a vocal engineer who comes in who's like, Hey, that word's really weird to sing. Let's try <laughs> to change that. And that to me is what my process is like that. I write, do it all. I show up with a basically like the, like the template. And I'm like, let's just fill it. Right. I need help with just the fillings because that's what I need help with. Yeah, that makes total sense. And, you know, it makes me think about the idea of collaboration. Like, I I guess I'm curious for you when you're making music that's, you know, so personal. And I think authenticity is a word we've talked about a million times in this conversation. How do you how do you maintain that while you're working with other people? How do you stay open to other people's ideas, you know, trying to find whatever works best for the song and still make it feel like you? You know, I I come in here with it all written. Yeah. I come in here, I literally come in like and that's I've had a lot of sessions like they're like, whoa, this is crazy. You wrote the you wrote the whole song already. Like it's it's rare for me to come in and write a a song off off just you know, I do it sometimes when I'm in like crazy moods, but like I have so much I wanna say. I have so much already written out that I usually bring in a few ideas, a few templates that are all done. I'm like, this is it. We're not changing the theme. We're not changing the shit. But if you want to change a word here, I'm of course, I'm open. I think collaboration obviously is the biggest gift in music. I think people who think that artists write their song a solo are crazy. I'm yeah. like fans, just letting you know right now, go to Spotify. You can check all the fucking analytics. You can see who wrote it, who produced it. Who, there's it's 200 so people. It's so funny how songs. nobody knows you can do that. Like I feel like there's this weird <laughs> shit in EDM where it's like ghost <laughs> production, all this weird energy, which I totally get. Like there are some of your faves don't produce their own shit. And at, that's your, up for you to decide if you care because they're performing it. Do you give a fuck? I don't right. know. For me, I don't really give a fuck. But what... Some people do. I get it. If you're saying you're producing and you're not, you're kind of a liar. That's kind of weird. I don't fuck with that. But other than that, collaboration is the most beautiful gift. All our most favorite songs are collaborations because hello, if I'm bringing an amazing idea, you don't think other people have amazing ideas to make it even more amazing. What a beautiful right. idea, right? Like I'm like, to me, collaboration is the biggest gift. And I, I love talking about it. I tag all my writers, whoever writes with me. I tag my producers. I'm not out here saying I do everything on my own. I don't. Oh my God, I wish. Are you kidding me? If <laughs> yeah, I that would be talent, nice, right? Yeah. That'd be nice. And there's some people who do that and those are gifted savants. And I'm like, holy shit, you are. I'm not. I'm an average chick with average talent. I'm coming out here just trying my best. And I think it's really important to be honest about that and to talk about how beautiful collaboration is because that's how beautiful songs get made. And I feel like I come in with these lyrics and I come in with this moment and I sit and I go, help me with melody. I'm really having a hard time on chorus melody. It's really what my struggles are. We come all together. I love it. We do it. I sing it. Blah, 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 and it turns into this beautiful record. Well, and to all, me, that's yeah, gorgeous. Of course. And, uh, you know, all the biggest pop songs in the world were made by a lot of people collaborating Even together. Even EDM. Go look. It's on Spotify. Go look. You can yeah, see who's writing for, it. You can for see For anybody who doesn't it. know what we're talking about, just click the show credits button. Right click on the song. There's the little dots. Click on the dots. Look at the show credits button on some of your favorite songs. You might be surprised. You might be surprised. I mean, I know some artists who pay specifically to not have credits on theirs. That's a thing. Ball, oh, I know that which too. Which is another yeah. ball game in itself. And at the end of the day, I think EDM, like the community as a whole, needs to get rid of this whole weird, this weird thing where it's like, you can't get help, but you're a ghost <laughs> production. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> at the end of the day, it's happening, whether you like it or not. And it's up to you. If you care a lot, if you really want to support an artist that just produces their own shit, then there's artists who can do that. Yeah. But you can't get mad at people. You can't, you judge people. You can't assume anything. You have to just look at the facts and look what they're saying and be more open. I think that like people should be, especially like main stage acts, should be a little more honest and more open to normalize it. Because I think it's it's really taboo subject where it's like no one talks about it. But then you go look on credits and there's 19 different producers and not even your artist is not on there. Well, who cares, right? Yeah. 
I think we should get to a place where DJs are performing and that's still a really cool act that they're doing. I mean, if they didn't produce the music, maybe that's not their thing, but maybe they were really good at DJing. Well, and the funny thing is, I don't, I don't really think that many people would care if it was just out in the open anyway. I just think when people lie, I think it puts this yeah. weird like energy out there. I think people it's weird care to when lie. you lie for sure. But yeah, I'm just I, like, who, like, why are you hiding it? Like, it doesn't matter, right? Like, right. the collaboration's gorgeous, and all our every top song has collab. Every top song is collaborative, right? Right, ninety exactly. percent of them. So I'm like, it's normalized in music, but yeah. it's not normalized in EDM. I think again, it's probably it, it's probably because money is involved, right? And people are like, you know, we have this culture of of putting artists on pedestals, and you know, oh, these are these genius yeah. beings who are not like us, yeah. you know, and yeah. that kind of thing. And I get that, and that's obviously been going on for way longer than I've been alive. So. I, I get it, but then at the same time, I also don't think people would care that much if we just stopped doing that. You know? Yeah, what I, mean? I mean, like when I was in EDM and I was like producing like bare bones trap songs, and like Rob was helping me, and I, have, I always had someone mix a master for me, and I felt this weird pressure that like specifically women were like, it was always told like you're not making your own shit, blah, blah, blah. and I was sitting here like, but I, I, who cares if we're collaborating? I'm being <laughs> right. honest about it. like why do I have to lie? Like, it felt weird that like other peers of mine too. We're lying because they're like, oh, I, I want to be taken seriously as a woman. So I'm lying. I'm like, but why Why can't you just come out and say what you're doing is cool? You're still a DJ. You're still an artist, right? Like To me, it's like it's this weird pressure that EDM like had on artists that like they have to like just be the only person on their project working on it. But I'm like, this is not how normal music is made, right? So right. I'm like, why do we have this weird pressure on it when people should just be honest? And it got, then it got to a point where people were lying because they were scared of the reaction. And so then it got to this weird, now it's like this whole thing where I'm like, Fans don't even know shit. Like, there's so much you don't know. <laughs> yeah. You know, and yeah. I, I want to be more honest. And that's why I always tell, like, I told everybody after, after I started doing chop, I'm like, uh, yeah, I don't really produce anymore. I don't. I assist always. And like, I'm always there. And I, I love, I'm, I'm very particular. And I'm very, I'm like a basically a micromanager to whoever produces. I'm of like, course. I want this drum. I want this sample. Blah, 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 blah. But I don't sit and produce anymore. I don't. I songwrite and I sing and I write. And that's kind of like where my doesn't make me any less of an artist. No, right? just you just changes your you change what you love to do. It's great. And I think no. that people should be, have that have that opportunity because it gets rough out there. Man. I, like I think it actually makes you stand out more than anything else. You know, like. <laughs> but sometimes I feel crazy, right? Sometimes I feel like people are like, "Whoa, like you don't produce anymore, like you're fake." And I'm like. I'm like, do you not know what music industry is? I right. mean, you don't know the top <laughs> charts of music. I'm not making EDM music anymore. Right. Yeah. Like, of course, I need collaboration. That's what songwriting is. That's why it's beautiful. That's why every top song has 200 writers on it. Like, you know, I've seen songs that have literally 60 artists, 60 writers. Oh, yeah. 100%. You know? Or like, you know, I got to this, I got to pop and I realized that all these songs are uh, sent around. So like the song that Miley Cyrus put out was actually a Selena Gomez song. Like I actually got gifted to Demi Lovato that got moved around to here. Then I listened to it. I didn't want it. And then I'm like, you don't even understand like half, like half the shit they're not even writing anymore. And I really want to be an advocate for songwriters and producers and give them their, their credit and airtime. Yep. So I'm friends with a lot of them and they get shit on, straight up shit on. Um, and I think that's really unfair. And I think that we need to change the narrative of that too. Yeah, it's a weird thing uh, This because the same thing happens with, you know, featured vocalists on uh, yeah. on dance songs. It's the exact same thing where it's... Brutal. Well, yeah, and it's brutal. And, and these are the people who are really like defining these songs. Like they're the ones giving them breathing personality. Yeah, breathing them to life. That's the perfect way to put it. And somehow the, those are the ones that we kind of just shove in the back. It's It's a weird thing. The audience had a few questions. Can I Absolutely. throw a couple questions Absolutely. at you? Uh, amazing. Of course, throw them. Okay, this is from uh, from Sonia in Portland. Shout out to Portland. Um, I like Portland. She is asking, what advice do you have to find women mentors in music? Honestly, just looking around. Like, look, just researching. You know, like, it's we're everywhere. I mean, also, like, looking at other women and look at their following. So that's what I've done recently. Like, I'll go through someone, I, a woman I admire. I look through her following and see what women she follows. I do that a lot to see. Um, but a lot of it's just looking around. It's one of those things where social media is such a weird age that we have to just research for ourselves because there's no book on how. There's no, like, list of amazing women. There's just... They're everywhere. So just honestly... Find other women you like and look at their followings and see who they interact with. Because you, you, the women that you inspire are probably also talking to other really cool women because that's how it works. 
So just looking at their social media and seeing what they support and seeing who they follow and who they interact with and then finding more and more and more and more and more. Yeah. And go down those rabbit holes. You know, maybe yeah. maybe one of those women has a discord and maybe in that yeah. discord, there's a bunch of people talking, you know, all exactly. that kind of thing. Like that's that's super smart. Like look yeah. at who they're following. Look at who they're interacting. I, I love that answer. Um, all right. Next next question. Bintu from Colorado it asked, what inspired the song Fractions? I uh, said, that shit got me through so much. I'm curious what it means to you. Oh, and apparently also uh, they met you this Friday in VIP and said, thank you for being so nice. Thank you. Thank you for coming. You were saying hi. Um, Fractions is a song, actually, my first love song that I wrote about being in love with Hayden. And I wrote it about just like giving yourself to somebody, even giving a fraction of yourself to somebody is a really awesome, beautiful thing. But it's like hard to get there. It's like a mountain climb. So I was like, I just wanted to write a song about how like the struggle I had for me actually giving myself to somebody and get loving somebody. Um, and having that like kind of internal battle with yourself to like let yourself go and be vulnerable. And that's kind of what the song's about. I love that. That's still, I said this uh, when your internet died, but that still might be my favorite song of yours. That's just like, that's, that's the banger for me. Thank you. Of course. How do you actually, now that we're talking about, I'm curious, how do you, how are you with songs you've already put out in your older work? Cause I know for some people it's like, ah, I don't like to revisit my older songs. Some people, it's like, oh, I, I'll never stop playing this song. <laughs> How do you look back on your older work? I feel like all my lyrics are very meaningful to me because um, it was a part of, you know, they really are. The songs really are from my heart and soul. Um, and they're really emotional. So like, I feel like I always assert, I always look back at my my EP or like my, the words that I'm writing and the words that I'm seeing. I don't go and listen to it really because I feel like it's like an actor watching themselves act. It's like... You know, I sing them all the time. I, I, I'm a stick of the songs. You know, I've already, I know every single second of the song. So it's, I'm not want to listen to it, but I do like to reflect in the, what I wrote and sometimes look back and see that how I'm writing is changing, how my emotions are changing. I think it's really cool to look back and see like how different I was feeling back then. I can really like, it's crazy. Like just putting my EP on, I can really feel how heartbroken I was. Mm. And so it's kind of crazy to like go think back and when I'm listening to it, think back of that that time and like that place and like how what a dark place that was. It's cool to like be able to look back and have like a moment of time kind of like solidified in this like body of work. It's really cool. Yeah. I don't listen to it. I never like jam out to my own music ever. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that feels weird. Yeah. I, which is weird though, because I'm sure you, as much as I know someone who does, like we know those people who all they do is listen to their own music. I can't. I am not that big of a fan of myself. Like I love myself, but I'm like I'm a fan of other shit. I don't want to listen. Like I, I don't want to shit where I eat. You know, like I write my music, I play my music, I sing my. It's me. I don't want to then go home and jam out to myself. Right. <laughs> I'm like, get me away from me. Yeah, you know? exactly. Like, I I, I, I'll get sick of myself for sure. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> do you have Do you have uh, people you look to as inspirations for specifically songwriting? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's like Benny Blanco there's a there's a lot of like amazing producers and writers out there that I'm like really inspired by but I try to honestly find inspiration from back in the day like I try to find inspiration from like Joan Jett, Alanis Morissette, Stevie Nicks, Fleetwood Mac I try to get a lot of inspiration from the old legends because that's what made me love music and Mm. I feel like today I've had a struggle of finding this millennium of like this millennial like idol to me I don't really have yet I just really like look back to all my old school like no doubt, like Gwen Stefani, like those old women rock stars who were doing something that like was not normal for women to do. Right. And we're getting shit on all the time. And so like for me, like I think about them and like how powerful they were to be doing that and standing up for themselves and like just doing their shit when everyone was shitting on them, you know, like to me, that's so powerful. And that's what really inspires me. So I kind of look at all those old rock stars and how they wrote their music was so crazy. And they'd just be partying and like drunk and doing Coke and like writing crazy. <laughs> like to me, like that's such a crazy experience. Right. But I kind of want to put myself in those shoes back just to see like their process and how crazy it was back then. It was so much different. Yeah. Um. So I kind of try to go there and look at that and try to make, make really authentic, like emotional music. That's kind of why I'm, and that's why I don't, take any runs writing. Like I get a lot of songs sent to me for pitch and I'm like, no, cause like I have to write it. It mm. has to come from my heart or I'm not going to like it. That makes total sense. And you, those examples you just gave Gwen Stefani, all that, I, it, it actually connected something in my brain because when they were doing what they did, they were, they were also sort of on their own path. Like you couldn't categorize them with anybody mm-hmm. else. Right. And I'm sure at the time, some people are like, Oh, why are you doing this? Why are you, 
changing your sound? Why are you making this kind of music that doesn't fit in? And yeah, those kind of success stories, that makes total sense to me. Yeah, that's where I kind of pull my inspiration for today because I, I want to still be that. I want to still be rocking with them. And I want to still be like giving them my hats off because I feel like they started the journey for me in my career. And I want to continue to support them and kind of have that rock. Oh, no. <laughs> we were so close to bringing it home. Oh, man. <laughs>